Good morning or good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this webinar. We are excited as Pearson to talk to you about the forthcoming Daily Scales of Infant and Toddler Development, the fourth edition. We'll refer to it as the Bailey 4. We will publish the Bailey 4 later this year. Before we get started, just to give us an idea of who has joined us today for this webinar, if you would take just a second and identify the, ro the, the professional here that best captures your role. So whether you're an administrator, early childhood professional, or physical or occupational therapist, if you would let us know your role so we can get an idea of who has joined us today. And then we'll show the results here. Looks like most of you fall in that other category, so we'll see what that is. Number of early childhood professionals, several early intervention specialists, occupational therapists, physical therapists, and then most of you fall into the category of other, and that might be directors or program managers for early intervention programs and so on. Okay, let's see, occupational therapist, nursing, or any other medical professional, not just nursing, but if you're a medical professional or in the healthcare industry, um, that might be falling under other. Okay, so if you think about um, psychologists, oh, I forgot psychologists. How could I do that? I meant to include psychologists here. Okay, um, sorry about that. Um, so that probably captures some of the um, psychologists as well, because as we know, psychologists, both clinical psychologists, pediatric psychologists, school psychologists also work with the Bailey. So in terms of our content today, we'll go through this in the next um, 42 minutes or so. We're going to focus on the purpose of the Bailey 4. We want to talk to you about the revision goals, certainly some of the changes that we've made to the subtests and also to the administration, the scoring, and the interpretation. And certainly there are going to be changes to the administration and scoring. The interpretation, I think, is going to be consistent with what we described on the Bailey 3. So again, if you would let us know what my foundation is here, whether or not you are using or you have used the Bailey 3, if you would select either yes or no in response to that question. And I'm going to skip to the results. And it looks like most people have used the Bailey 3. So that will provide us with a solid foundation. We can then focus on the changes from the Bailey 3 to the Bailey 4. If you're not familiar with the Bailey 3, this will be your introduction to the Bailey starting with the fourth edition. So thank you very much for your responses. So I think in terms of Everybody who is familiar with the Bailey 3, you know that effectively it is a developmental assessment that we use to identify infants and toddlers who have a develop developmental delay. And the importance of early identification is certainly so that we can provide early intervention services. So the federal mandate, the federal leg legislation, as you know, that guides the provision of early intervention services is Part C of the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, Part C, the Early Intervention Program for Infants and Toddlers with Disabilities. And those of us who've been around for a few years know that Part C has replaced the former Part H. So when you think about the relationship between Part C and the Bailey 4, According to IDEA Part C, the early intervention services that we provide for infants and toddlers are designed to identify a child's needs and to meet the child's needs in five developmental areas. And the law specifies these areas, physical development, cognitive development, communication, social, emotional, and adaptive development. So when we look at the Bailey 4 and being familiar with the Bailey 3, you know that the Bailey 3, starting with the Bailey 3, we assess development in these five broad domains. Physical development, including vision and hearing, also including motor development, 
the cognitive, the language, social, emotional, and adaptive behavior. So I want to talk a little bit about the revision goals. Um, and when we think about revision goals, we think about um, when, when a test publisher embarks or starts discussions relating to the revision of an existing assessment, such as, in this case, the Bailey 3. And so the research directors and test developers set or established a number of revision goals. Effectively, first of all, we wanted to make maintain the basic qualities and format of the Bailey 3. We also wanted to develop a scoring approach that would allow us to differentiate mastery, emergence, and absence of a skill. We are referring to this as a polytomous scoring approach. We also recognize the importance of including caregivers in the evaluation and scoring process. And I'll tell you how we did that for the Bailey Four. In addition, we wanted to simplify the administration, reduce testing time, improve the age and content coverage of the subtests, and certainly in terms of technical properties, we wanted to improve the clinical utility of the instrument, update, update the normative data, and increase the sensitivity. So I want to say a few more words about each of these revision goals, starting with maintaining basic qualities of the instrument. And so when you look at the Bailey 4, and I'll show you parts of it here today, the Bailey 4, like the Bailey 3, which we published in 2006, is designed to assess the level of performance of infants and toddlers. And the way that we do that is we observe the child's interaction with stimuli that we believe would be engaging for young children. In terms of the actual content, you're thinking about looking at tools that would allow us to assess, or items that will allow us to assess developmental functioning of infants and young children starting at 16 days and going up through 42 months, three and a half years. And as we know, in terms of early intervention programs, you're thinking about infants and toddlers from birth through two or birth to three, as well as their families. So the basic format of the Bailey 3, it remains an individually administered assessment that theoretically will provide us with information about the child's developmental functioning in five developmental domains. And those developmental domains are consistent with the with Part C, the domains are cognitive, language, motor, social, emotional, and adaptive behavior. Now, in terms of the structure, and this is going to be the structure that you'll see presented on the record form for the Bailey 4, um, the structure of the Bailey 4 in terms of these three broad domains or these three scales that I have pictured here, which are cognitive, language, and motor, the structure has remained consistent with that of the Bailey 3. So we have a cognitive scale consisting of a cognitive subtest, a language scale consisting of two subtests, receptive and expressive communication, and a motor scale consisting of fine motor and gross motor. These three scales are what we refer to as performance-based, which means that you as the clinician will interact directly with the child. You will document the child's performance in order to generate scores that will allow you to describe the child's cognitive language and motor abilities. In addition to these three performance-based domains, we have two additional domains, social, emotional, and adaptive behavior, and the information to describe the child's social, emotional, and adaptive behavior would be generated from information provided by the parent or caregiver. Now, the social emotional section, you'll recognize it's consistent with that of the Bailey 3. If you're familiar with Bailey 3, you'll recognize some changes here in terms of adaptive behavior. The adaptive behavior section will be comprised of three subdomains, communication, which includes receptive and expressive skills, 
daily living skills, which focuses on a section referred to as personal, and socialization, which is comprised of interpersonal relations, play, and leisure. So all of these components, this information for adaptive behavior I'll talk about in more detail here in a minute, but that information actually comes from the Vineland Adaptive Behavior Scales, the third edition. Those of us who are familiar with the Bailey 3, you know that the adaptive behavior section on the Bailey 3 um, came from the adaptive behavior assessment system. I also mentioned that one of the revision goals was to develop a polytomous scoring system. The Bailey 3, um, as most of you know, um, used dichotomous scoring. So we would assign a score of one for the items on cognitive, language, and motor scales if the child demonstrated the behavior assessed by the item. We would assign a score of zero if the child's behavior did not meet the criteria specified for that item. Now, what we know about early development really is that early development is dynamic and it's uneven. So a dichotomous scoring system really doesn't allow us to distinguish between children who might show some evidence of this skill and children who show no evidence of this skill. In both of those situations, the score for the item on the Bailey 3 would be assigned zero. The polytomous scoring system allows us to score um, for mastery, in which case we'd assign two points for the item. And if that skill or behavior is emerging, we'd assign a score of one. If the skill or behavior is not present, we'd assign a score of zero. So that is going to be a significant change in terms of the scoring system. The other significant change is the inclusion of caregivers in the evaluation and scoring process. Now with the Bailey 3, we certainly talk about the importance of having the parent or caregiver in the room when we are um, presenting the items to the child, but the Bailey 4 will actually include a number of structured test items that have associated with them caregiver questions. So if you don't observe the child demonstrating the behavior, you can ask the caregiver if the child demonstrates that behavior in the home environment. There are also a number of caregiver questions that we use to provide or to elicit additional information. And then we actually have some items that are scored entirely based on information provided by the caregiver. An example would be um, those play items that are include that are part of the cognitive scale. Now, we don't use caregiver questions for items that involve performance on test specific tasks. So, for example, if you want to see if the child can count, for example, those would be items um, with which caregiver questions would not be associated. I think another revision goal was really to simplify administration and reduce administration time. And to accomplish those goals, we developed the Bailey 4 on QGlobal, the digital administration. I'll talk more about that here in a minute. We also combined a number of items, eliminated redundant items, and I already mentioned the inclusion of caregiver questions, which we believe will simplify the administration. We also wanted to improve the age and content coverage, and to that end, we added items to assess neurodevelopment. We also added items to assess precursors to executive functioning. Another important component, of course, was is the clinical utility. And during the standardization phase or the development phase of the Bailey 4, we conducted a number of special group studies to evaluate the clinical utility of the Bailey 4. So we collected data for infants and toddlers 
who might have a condition that would place him or her at developmental risk. So think about um, babies who were born extremely preterm or very preterm. We also looked at children with clinical diagnoses, for example, autism spectrum disorder, Down syndrome, and language impairments. We'll talk more about the characteristics of the standardization sample as we move forward with our um, development process and the, the analyzing of our data. But one of the things I want to tell you now about our standardization sample is that there were two samples that we collected during the standardization phase of the Bailey. The first one is the um, sample for cognitive language and motor, the normative sample for cognitive language and motor. And a second sample was the normative sample for the social emotional scale. A third sample, the adaptive behavior scale normative sample, was analyzed during standardization, but had been collected prior to the start of the Bailey IV standardization phase. The data had been collected as part of the development of the Violent Three. What I want to tell you now about the characteristics, especially of sample one, the cognitive language and motor scale normative sample, is that that particular sample excluded children with known clinical conditions, except for approximately 34 children who participated in a special group study for Down syndrome. And I think that that is important because it really helps us to think about the impact of including children with known clinical conditions. Because we excluded most children with known clinical conditions, we noticed that the reliability of the scales increased, but this did not have a negative impact on the clinical sensitivity and did not inflate the norms. So we'll talk more about the characteristics of our standardization samples as we move forward with development. In terms of reliability, you'll notice that for your broad scales, cognitive, language, and motor, your average reliability is pretty high in the 90s, language 0.96, motor 0.95, and then your subtest um, reliability coefficients also in the 90s. I mentioned that we also wanted to increase sensitivity. We want to make sure that the Bailey Four will be able to correctly identify infants and toddlers with developmental delay. And to that end, I mentioned already that we excluded from the normative sample children identified as at risk. We also introduced the polytomous scoring approach, and we included some additional easier items to improve the floor of the sections. So in terms of, let me just skip that over in in the interest of time. In terms of our subtest changes, I want to tell you a little bit about um, the changes that we made to the subtest. You will recognize most of the items on these scales. For cognitive, for example, we retained most of the items from the Bailey 3. We did add several new items. We also deleted several items, and we combined several items to reduce administration time. If you're familiar with the Bailey 3, I'm sure you know that the Bailey 3 had 91 items on the cognitive subtest. For Bailey 4, this will include 81 items. I already showed you that the structure of language has of the language scale has remained consistent with that of the Bailey 3. The language scale includes receptive and expressive communication. We added a number of new items that reflect traditional language milestones and related speech processes. Just like for cognitive, we combined several items from the Bailey 3, and we dropped items that were determined to be redundant based on construct overlap. Again, you'll notice that the number of items has decreased from Bailey 3 to Bailey 4. Receptive communication, 49 on Bailey 3, 42 on Bailey 4. Expressive communication, 48 on Bailey 3, 37 on Bailey 4. Similarly, for the motor scale, we combined items, we dropped items, we added new items, 
to expand age and content coverage, which I mentioned before, and also to measure neurodevelopmental functions. Again, if you look at the number of items, 66 for fine motor on Bailey 3, now 46 on Bailey 4, 72 for gross motor on Bailey 3, now 58 on Bailey 4. So again, the reduction in items um, certainly will also decrease the administration time. In terms of the social-emotional scale, I mentioned that this section or this scale remains unchanged from the Bailey 3. It it is on the Bailey 4 and was on the Bailey 3, an adaptation of Greenspan social emotional growth chart, and the items effectively assess the child's mastery of functional emotional skills. And as we know for young children, social emotional development is a good predictor of of continued development, of functioning in early childhood programs. So having information on social emotional development really allows us to, um, to intervene as early as we can and hopefully to ameliorate some of those social emotional skills that might adversely impact the child's functioning in early childhood programs. And then I mentioned the adaptive behavior section. And with respect to adaptive behavior, I already mentioned that the items are from the Vineland Adaptive Behavior Scales, the third edition. The adaptive behavior scale on the um, Bailey 4 includes 120 items, and the most of these items come from the communication section, specifically receptive and expressive um, sections, and those items will form communication, the communication subdomain. We include um, several items from the personal section, which will which will load on the daily living skills subdomain. And then also 39 items were retained from the interpersonal and play and leisure sections from the Vineland 3, and those will comprise the socialization subdomain. So again, this information comes from the comprehensive parent caregiver form of the Vineland 3. Compared to the adaptive behavior section on the Bailey 3, the number of items has been effectively cut in about half. So again, you're thinking about, about this scale as being more efficient. And there's another factor that makes the administration of adaptive behavior more efficient. And those of us who are familiar with the Bailey 3, you could probably already start guessing what that is. We didn't have a discontinued criterion on the um, adaptive behavior section on the Bailey 3. We do have a discontinued criterion for each of the sections on adaptive behavior for the Bailey 4. I'll show you that here in a minute. In terms of the administration, what I want to say about that is that you now have the, op the option of using the paper record form and the paper manual for your administration, and you can do so and in conjunction with your paper administration and paper item scoring, you can use the Q Global scoring system to convert your raw scores to different types of standardized scores. But in addition to that paper administration or paper it combined with um, Q Global, um, paper administration combined with Q Global scoring, you can also use a complete digital administration scoring and reporting option, which I want to show you what that's going to look like here. Certainly, if you're using the paper administration, you will have the materials that are in the Bailey 4 kit. And one of the pieces that is going to be different is there is going to be a separate motor response booklet. If you are familiar with the Bailey 3, you remember that inside the Bailey 3 record form, there were some pages that we were asked to remove if we, if we were working with a, a child who was 
toward the upper end of our standardization age range um, because the child needed to, um, to write and, and draw and those kinds of things. That is now a separate response booklet so that you only pull that out when you're working with a child of a certain age. But everything else I think is going to be pretty consistent. One of the pieces that we've integrated with our stimulus book is what in the Bailey 3 kit was a picture book. Those pictures are now part of our stimulus book. But we'll still have the cognitive language and motor record form and then the social, emotional, and adaptive, adaptive behavior questionnaire. And I'll say a few more words about this observation checklist. In terms of our digital administration, the digital administration is going to be for the examiner. So instead of needing the paper record form and the paper manual, you can use any internet-based mobile device, um, whether you're using a laptop or a PC, or any, any tablet that has a screen size that is about the size of an iPad. Um, I think the user experience experience is, is not the best if you're using any device that has a, a screen size that is smaller than a tablet. So the digital administration is for the clinician or the examiner. The, the child, the infant or toddler does not inter interact with that device. Effectively, what the device does is it combines the information from the record form and the administration manual in one place so that when you um, would have to go to the record form to see the title of the item, to see the position in which the child should be placed, um, to see what materials you need, all of that information will be combined now on you, the device that you're using. And this, we hope, is going to be a time saver because using this digital administration that is designed to support nonlinear administration of items on the cognitive language and motor scales. Effectively, when we're working with young children, young children um, don't necessarily respond on cue the way older children do, as we all know, and therefore sometimes the child might exhibit a behavior that we might need to, that we theoretically would have to elicit later on. If the child exhibits that behavior, we can go ahead and associate a score with that behavior using this nonlinear administration. So it's still important for us to be able to administer the items in the, the order in which they are presented, in numerical order, because of course there is going to be a specific start point by the child's age. There is going to be a discontinue criterion, and that's, that discontinue criterion is going to be the same as it was on Bailey 3, five consecutive scores of zero. And the start point is going to be um, certainly an age-appropriate start point. We also include the adjustment for prematurity up to 24 months. And once you identify the start point, you administer items in forward sequence until you establish a basal. And for the Bailey 3, the basal was three consecutive scores of one at the start point or from the start point. And now um, the basal is going to be three consecutive perfect scores, which will be three consecutive scores of two. If you don't establish a basal, you reverse to the previous start point, administer the items in forward sequence until you establish a basal. So the order of the items still is important, but the Bailey 4 is designed to allow for flexibility. So it's really important when we're working with young children to be able to be flexible. One of the things that I've always found in working with a Bailey is that once you present a certain 
corrupt set of manipulatives to a child, children lose interest in those manipulatives. So um, the way the items are arranged, I may need the same manipulatives for maybe item 20 and then later on item 27. Um, children really are less interested in the manipulatives when they are no longer novel. And so the Bailey 4 has integrated this flexibility that will allow you to to present all of the items that would use the same manipulatives, for example. So in that context, I want to talk a little bit about the series items, the related items, and then finally the multiple trial items. So series items we have on the Bailey, on the Bailey 3, and those are items, um, if you're familiar, you'll know that they have the same administration directions, but they require varying levels of performance to meet the scoring criteria. So for example, maybe there are two items on cognitive in the pink board series, and one item would require the child to position two pieces correctly within a specified time in order to get credit, say, for item 40. And then 47, you would require the child to position all three pieces correctly within the allotted time. So if you're using the paper record form, you will see all of the series items um, on the record form itself. If you're using the digital administration, the Q Global system will configure all of the series items to allow for what series items are designed to do, which is a single administration. And the system will record a single response and then will automatically score all of the items in that series. I'll show you an example of what that looks like on the digital system here in a minute. But in addition, and this is a question that we um, often got asked for Bailey 3, well, if all of these items are related, how is it that we can't just go ahead and score these items based on the child's performance on a related item? Or why is it that we can't administer all of these related items in sequence? So the Bailey 4 will allow us to do that. So for items that might have different administration directions, but that would require the use of the same test materials, or that would require the child to participate in similar activities, we can administer those items when we have the materials out for the first item. So on the paper version, you will see next to your series items icons, you will see this section here for related items. And we'll tell you that these items are all related, maybe because they all require the same materials. If you're using maybe the um, digital application, here for example, what's going to capture those related items is going to be this filtering option that you have. So for example, if I have an item here that for which I need the block, one of the options that you'll see is you can filter down here, you can filter by pickup block. And once you click that filter command, what will pop up would be all of the items that would require the use of that block. So again, being able to present these related items even when they do not appear consecutively in the item set, again, we hope that that is going to improve the efficiency of the administration. And just to show you what that series item would look like, and this is an example of both an item that has multiple trials. There are a number of items on the Bailey um, 3 and 4 that, that for scoring will require multiple trials. And so we want to look at the scoring criteria, like here, this item that has 12 different trials. And what will pop up here in these boxes that I have covered up would be the title, what we're looking for, actually. You'll see that when you are on the screen. But we're looking here for a multiple trial item that's also part of a series. 
And this item is part of the picture series. The first item in the series requires for a perfect score, um, three correct, and then for a perfect score for this second item in the series, you would require the child should um, have six correct. So as you're working through on the screen, you will be identifying whether the child responded correctly by simply clicking on that icon and then once you get the the as soon as you get 3 this score will be suggested for you based on the criteria for that first item in the series and as soon as you get 6 correct you'll notice that this score of 2 will be suggested for you you'll also see this command um, once you have once the child's responses have met the criteria for the items in the series you will see that the system will prompt you that you've achieved the maximum score for this item you may continue to the next item certainly we all know for for um, for our own information we can continue to administer trials 7 to 12 but the system will tell you that you already have the information you need to be able to score the item so in terms of the item scoring I've already mentioned 0 2 and 1 and it will be projected on the record form for you just as it is with a digital application but for some items that have a caregiver associated question, certainly if you see the behavior, um, if you observe the behavior, you go ahead and assign a score of two. If you need to present the caregiver question and the caregiver says the child demonstrates the behavior almost every time when given the opportunity, you'd assign a score of two points as well. And same thing for emerging and not present. So those scores 2, 1, or 0 can be based on your observation of the child demonstrating the behavior, can be, can be based on the caregiver response if the item has a caregiver associated question. And if there is not a caregiver question associated with the item, then you may need to elicit that behavior by using the standardized instructions to present the item. Incidental observation is, is um, we discuss it, we describe it on the Bailey 3. Again, incidental observation, um, if you observe that the child exhibits the behavior, and let me just go back here for a second and show you one of the things in this filtering picture you notice, one of the the variables by which you can filter is observation, right? So a number of items on the Bailey can be scored through incidental observation. And what we tell you is if you observe the child demonstrating the behavior, go ahead and score based on mastery, emerging, and so on. If you don't observe the child demonstrate that behavior spontaneously, then you go ahead and use the standardized instructions to elicit that behavior. So the items that theoretically could be scored through incidental observation are going to be part of an observation checklist that will be, that will be included in the Bailey 4 kit. So I think there are going to be a number of changes that we hope will reduce administration time and improve the efficiency of the administration. In terms of the questionnaire, you also have the option of the paper version, and this is the top section of the paper version. And you also have the, the option of having the parent complete the questionnaire remotely. So in order to be able to do that, you as the clinician would, would set that up on your Q Global system and, and you would send a link to the parent or caregiver and the parent or caregiver would complete, complete the questionnaire and then you'll be notified when it's completed. I mentioned that stop point for adaptive behavior, but if you're familiar with Bailey 3, you know that unlike cognitive language and motor, for which each item would earn a score of now 2, 1, 
or zero, for social, emotional, and adaptive behavior, we're looking at the frequency with which the child demonstrates specified behaviors. So effectively, what we'll tell the parent is to start with item one, read the statement, and then identify or circle the frequency with which the child demonstrates that behavior. So, for example, five for all of the time. And then you stop. There are age-appropriate stop points for the social-emotional component. So when you reach the stop point associated with the child's age, that's when you stop. For adaptive behavior, you will have five sections, and we will, we will instruct the parent or caregiver to start with item one for each section, and again, read each statement and circle the frequency with which the child demonstrates that behavior, um, and then you stop the sections when you've circled five scores in a row. So the discontinue criterion for adaptive behavior is going to be, cons for each section, is going to be consistent with the discontinue criterion for cognitive language and motor. So the other thing I want to tell you about is um, the scores or the scoring. Once you have the item scores for cognitive language and motor, and you can use the item level scores to derive a raw score. And certainly for, for cognitive, for example, where I mentioned it includes 81 items and the maximum possible score per item would be two points, the maximum possible raw score for cognitive would be 162, right? So once you have the raw score for cognitive, receptive and expressive communication, fine motor and gross motor, you were able to generate a raw score by adding up all of the, um, the ratings that the parents circled for social, emotional, and adaptive behavior, you are then ready to to convert those raw scores to different types of standardized scores. And to do so, you could certainly use the tables in the manual, but you can also use the scoring software, the scoring on our Q Global system, even if you used the paper administration. Now, the different types of standardized scores that you'll be able to derive depends on whether you're looking at the scale or you're looking at the subdomain or the subtest. So when you look at all of those scales, and I tried to present them here in red just so they could stand out, cognitive, language, motor, social, emotional, and adaptive behavior, as well as the adaptive behavior subdomains, communication, daily living skills, and socialization, you look over here where I have all of these red Xs, and you could see that all of those will yield a composite score. They'll also yield a percentile rank, and they'll yield a confidence interval. When you look at the subtests themselves, you'll notice that those will yield a scale score, so cognitive, receptive, and expressive communication, fine motor and gross motor, for example. They will yield scaled scores. They'll also yield age equivalents and growth scale values. And the one I want to point out here is under social emotional, where we're using a cut score, just like we did on the Bailey 3, to identify any possible challenges in sensory processing. And then finally, in terms of the interpretation, and I don't think that there are any changes in the interpretation, but in terms of the interpretation um, to focus on diagnosing developmental delay, we, we know that there is no universally accepted definition of developmental delay. The criteria vary, and different states use different criteria. But one definition of developmental delay would be to look at a percent delay, whether the child's cognitive, there is a 25% delay, for example, in the child's cognitive development, in the child's receptive communication. Another definition is to use a standard or deviation criterion so that some states would look at scores that are maybe one and a half standard deviations below the mean in two or more areas or some states say two standard deviations below the mean in one area. 
And then uh, a less precise criterion, but one that some states use, defines developmental delay as performing a certain number of months below chronological age. And certainly the age equivalent scores are going to be important if you're using um, that one. The other thing I want to tell you about the Bailey is that the Bailey 4, like the Bailey 3, will include um, several items that could potentially indicate developmental problems, such as motor and movement abnormalities, and some might be indicators or red flag items that would lead us to maybe investigate further possible autism spectrum disorder. And then we'll also have the caregiver report that we had on the Bailey 3 that you can use to share results with families. And one of the features that families like is the activities that they can use with their child. So just to summarize, I think in terms of the features of the Bailey 4 that we'll publish later in the fall, I talked about the flexible administration, the series items, the related items. We retained the five domains. The adaptive behavior section now comes from the Finland 3. Um, the administration certainly could be the manual administration, manual scoring, or manual administration Q global scoring. And then you also have the digital administration and scoring. And then I talked about the item scoring, that polytomous scoring system, 2, 1, or 0. Okay. So um, we, we are publishing the Bailey 4, as I mentioned, in the fall. We'll also publish the Bailey 4 screening test. Those of you who might use the screening test as well, be on the lookout for more information about the Bailey 4 screening test. I know we scheduled this webinar for um, 45 minutes, so I want to be cognizant of our time. If you have any questions, please send them along to me. My email address is here. It's also included in the handout, which I hope most of you received um, earlier, I think yesterday is when we sent it out. But we want to thank you for joining us for this introductory information on the Bailey 4. And we look forward to sharing additional information with you as our development proceeds. Thank you so much for coming.